All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Grand Rounds. Um, our presenters today are Dr. Ocharzik and Dr. Chandran. Um, Dr. Ocharzik was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She went to Villanova University outside of Philadelphia, and then MCP, Hanneman School of Medicine, now Drexel University. She did a year of fellowship at the NIH as a Howard Hughes Medical Scholar, and then completed her internship in general surgery at Jackson Memorial Hospital in Miami. She transferred to New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia, and Cornell University to do her otolaryngology residency. She completed her pediatric ENT fellowship at Texas Children's Hospital, Baylor University, and then stayed on staff there for four years. She then worked in pri private practice in Northern Virginia for four years prior to moving to Virginia to Louisville in 2017, where she's now an assistant professor in ENT. Dr. Chandran was born in Chicago. Uh, she completed her medical school and residency here at Louisville. She then went to fellowship in voice at Drexel University. She completed her pediatric ENT training at Nemours in Delaware and has been on faculty here since 2010. And with that, I will leave it to them. Thank you, Seth. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, Dr. Chandra and I are here to present together uh, the introduction to the Aero Digestive Clinic, which started back in October? Yeah, I think yeah, it was October. October of 2019. Um, we kind of wanted to introduce you to this clinic, which is a multi-specialty uh, multi clinic, and um, make you familiar with it um, here at uh, Norton Children's Hospital. We have no financial disclosures. All right, so um, the merger of Norton Children's Hospital and the Uni University of Louisville has really afforded the opportunity to move forward with the development of several multidisciplinary clinics I know um, the idea of the Aero Digestive Clinic had been in the works even before I got here. Dr. Chandra can speak to that a little bit. Um, and it had been a couple years and just kind of talking about it and trying to move forward with it. But it was really this merger that helped us move forward. I personally had started the Aero Digestive Clinic with a gastroenterologist and pulmonologist down in Texas Children, so I had some experience with that. And one reason that I really came to Louisville and was looking forward to working here was to start this Aero Digestive Clinic here. Um, it is designed so that we can coordinate care by a, multi, uh, by a couple specialists. Um, we all appreciate the interrelatedness of the complexity of the upper Aero Digestive System. We are also trying to coordinate care in hopes of improving outcomes and increasing care value by allowing all the providers to evaluate the patients in a single setting and then using this multidisciplinary care approach to communicate with the patients and each other a shared diagnostic approach to patient care. The, the clinic is currently comprised of a medical uh, medical doctor, surgical doctors, and allied health specialists. Anything to add? No, I think we, you know, have really, uh, as Vicki said, had been doing the care previously, but it was kind of parceled out, and we really knew each other well. All had patients that were mutual patients. We're doing a lot of phone calls and having the patients come. Um, back and forth several times and I think it just ended up delaying care. So using models set up um, by other institutions and having Vicki come, uh, you know, in 2017 really kind of helped formalize the, um, the model that we wanted to use for our particular digest, upper air digestive clinic, um, which was really needed in this community. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think a lot of people would look to our center and, um, you know, say, well, they don't have an upper air digestive clinic, but other surrounding um, medical centers would have that. And, um, and I think we all realize that we all, um, as clinicians here in the, um, at Norton uh, Children's Hospital, have the training and have the advanced training, but putting our heads together um, in a collective fashion in one setting was just not uh, necessarily possible prior to the merger. So um, we can't thank Norton's enough, and I can't thank Vicki enough for putting this all together. Um, our goal, we have several goals in starting the Aero Digestive Clinic, and I think that what uh, Sapna is talking about is, you know, patients would go to other 
um, universities and other children's hospitals to get this kind of care. Um, we are, one goal is to try to save patients time and cost in traveling. We have many, many patients who come from very far away in order to receive this uh, multi-specialty care. Um, this forces family to take off work and they subsequently have lost revenue, which can be a big burden to the families who are already taking care of pretty medically complex children. Um, another value that we can add is that if a patient requires any diagnostic procedures that require an anesthetic in the operating room, we can coordinate this care. And again, as Dr. Chandran said, we were doing this already, but it was taking a lot of coordination and changing of schedules and everything in order to have all of the providers be able to see the patient together in the operating room. So we can decrease the amount of anesthetic exposure events, and we together, when we're in the operating room together evaluating a patient, can kind of discuss the um, results and what we're seeing together and put a plan together in a more comprehensive man uh, manner. Um, Finally, we're able to uh, discuss our management strategy with other providers and with the pediatrician to further facilitate the continuity of care for these medically complex patients. So this is just a list of some of the um, diagnoses that um, were presented to us either individually or collectively, and these are some of the things that we um, see in the upper aerodigestive clinic. Really it's um, um, a series of diagnoses that um, occur in um, uh, either in the airway or in the, um, the swallowing mechanism. So that's, you know, anything um, from an ENT standpoint, anything from uh, the nose uh, down through the trachea, and then we also involve pulmonology um, for the, um, uh, the lungs as well, and then obviously gastroenterology um, with their uh, interrelatedness in uh, the upper air digestive. So, um, you know, here's a list. It's pretty comprehensive. Um, it's not exhaustive um, here at all, but it just kind of gives you a sense of the varied um, uh, indications for referring a patient uh, to the upper air digestive clinic. Um, so anything really that involves um, airway, swallowing, um, and voice as well. Um, so, uh, you know, like I said before, these were things that we were seeing um, either individually, even something like vocal fold paralysis, the implications of that sometimes would require a gastroenterologist or pulmonologist involved if you're talking about aspiration, even though the vocal cords is primarily something in the ENT realm. So by, um, by kind of coming there as a group and um, devising this very basic list, it kind of helped us um, uh, identify patients that would qualify to, uh, to be seen in our clinic. So, uh, as I stated before, so I have been working with individuals in gastroenterology and uh, pulmonology um, and, and having lots of outside of clinic conversations and tasks and, and um, discussions about patients. And so I really did get to know um, the, uh, the pulmonary teams, the gastroenterology teams, as well as the general surgery teams. I work very closely with the speech pathologists, both inside and um, outside of the hospital. And so over the last 10 years, I think um, as an otolaryngologist, I've developed a really close relationship with a lot of people that um, have helped my patients. Um, and uh, so we, we identified people that would be really interested in joining together um, and um, starting this clinic. And here's a list of um, um, who uh, comes together every month. Um, uh, and, you know, even though some of these um, practitioners are not the primary uh, practitioner, we definitely send information, like we said earlier, to the pediatrician, but to the originating gastroenterologist, to the originating um, pulmonologist. So we are here to serve um, kind of as an um, evaluative team that then um, disseminate information to, uh, to the other providers involved in the care of the patient. I want to also just uh, kind of give credit here to Dr. Temtem, Sega Temtem, who is a gastroenterologist. She also, I would say, kind of spearheaded this effort in starting the air digestive clinic down at Vanderbilt, where she did her 
uh, fellowship and she came uh, here with a lot of enthusiasm and um, ideas for how to get this program off the ground. So once patients are kind of identified as benefiting from the aerodigestive clinic, we are currently referring them to the clinic kind of amongst ourselves just at the current time. So somebody that we have been seeing, one of the subspecialists, either the gastroenterologist, um, the pulmonologist, or us, we are kind of self-referring to this clinic. Um, we started this way because we didn't want to overwhelm the system. Um, we're kind of, you know, starting getting, we're new at this and we wanted to kind of use ourselves as a self-referral at this time. Um, but word is really already getting out, especially in the hospitals and the ICUs about the clinic and um, requests have been made to refer patients to the Upper Air Digestive Clinic. Uh, Bree Martin is our nurse coordinator, um, as she is for most of the air, uh, most of the multidisciplinary clinics. So she's become very busy. Um, once we identify patients that we would like to refer to the clinic, she does a pre-evaluation. Um, this is done by phone and looking through the medical records to see what kind of testing and procedures that they have had done and to identify some of the testing that we may need to coordinate or have done before the visit. Um, these might include x-rays, CT scans, and what we are trying to do as well as um, if a patient needs a swallow study, a modified bearing swallow study, to have that coordinated on the same day as their visit um, to the aerodigestive clinic. Again, the importance of minimizing the number of appointments and uh, travel time for these patients. So basically now what we want to do is just go through some patients that we have already seen and treated through the aerodigestive clinics to kind of give you an idea of what we do and some of the outcome we have. So our, pa our first patient to present is RC. This is a two-year-old male who was referred to the aerodigestive clinic at two years of age. Um, sorry, he was first seen in the ENT clinic. Um, his history was that he was having hyperemesis up to eight times a day. He had a chronic dry cough. He was identified as having a possible submucosal cleft in the palate. He had some speech delay and was generally just small for his age. He was identified as having allergies to tree nuts, green peas, dust mites, and cats. He had been treated um, for a substantial portion of time on a H2 blocker for reflux, what was presumed to be reflux. His past surgical history was significant for bilateral meringotomy and twos for recurrent ear infections. Um, otherwise, he had no significant past medical history. He was born at 38 weeks um, via emergency C-section for preeclampsia. And when he was born, he was small for gestational age. Bad for him. During his workup, he was noted to have a negative sweat chloride test. Uh, once he was seen in the aerodigestive clinic, he was taken to the operating room for what we call a triple endoscopy. So this is one of the benefits of the aerodigestive clinic. This triple endoscopy includes a um, laryngoscopy and uh, rigid bronchoscopy that's done by the otolaryngologist. The flexible bronchoscopy and bronchoalveolar lavage is done by the pulmonologist, and then the um, EGD is done with the gastroenterologist, and this usually includes biopsies. So the results of this um, triple endoscopy in the operating room with the three providers showed a BAL with abundant pulmonary macrophages and reactive bronch bronchial epithelium. The lipid-laden macrophages index was 10 and there were no ciliary abnormalities seen. So that would be something we would be looking for with primary ciliary dyskinesia. Um, the esophagoscopy showed mucosal changes, including longitudinal furrows, white plaques, and congestion and edema were found through the entire esophagus. And I have some pictures to uh, represent that. So here you can see the furrowing, um, especially in this first slide with these white plaques. Um, and just congestion and edema. So three biopsies were taken by Dr. Temtem of the esophagus. 
the pathology showed um, no abnormal four, four, I'm sorry, four biopsies. So no abnormalities of the duodenum or stomach. Um, there was no helio Heliobacter pylori identified. But the three uh, biopsies of the esophagus at the distal, mid, and proximal esophagus, esophagus were positive for eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, as you can see here, there were 57, 48, and 65 eosinophils per high, per high, high powered field. So RC was then referred to an allergist and dietitian for further identification of uh, triggers as well as started on budesonide by mouth. Want to add anything to his presentation? Um, yeah. So I actually. Um, this is Dr. Chandran again. I actually saw him in clinic, and um, you know, this was a referral from um, the pediatrician. And so I thought with the hyperemesis, and um, he did have a cough, um, and the mom had stated that this was a lot of times related to nasal congestion and mucus. And so that's why I originally got the referral. Um, you know, and then upon seeing the child, um, realized that he was. Um, quite small um, and had these other associated findings, which frankly I thought was reflux and poorly controlled reflux that I didn't know that I could make better by myself. And so that was kind of um, the prompt for me to say, well, I know that we're going to at least need to see gastroenterology and pulmonology um, as a combo because he's got nasal congestion. So that's kind of my part cough, which is a crossroads between me and pulmonology, but then also this hyperemesis, maybe the cough as well related um, to some reflux, so um, that's where I thought that gastroenterology would come in. So that's kind of where the referral um, thought process came in for um, for RC, and um, you know, as Vicki stated, I think this really kind of helped put our heads together, and I think it would have taken a lot longer for us to come to this diagnosis of eosinophilic esophagitis, even though it's in our differential, um, but then going through the process of seeing um, Dr. Temtem in her office, then scheduling the EGD. So um, I thought this was a really great example of just how you know a referral for nasal congestion and cough just kind of really evolved into something that was a very appropriate aerodigestive patient. And he would have probably gotten multiple anesthetics as well, being taken to the operating room for maybe a nasal endoscopy, direct laryngoscopy with Dr. Chandran, and then when she didn't really identify anything, then referred to GI and then getting an EGD. So this is a great example too of a kid who we were able to just do one anesthetic on. And then, you know, we also do some anesthetics sometimes to get scans or exposed okay. to radiation for modifying swallows. And so I think just um, patient exposure to radiation and um, other things that, that probably can be consolidated um, is really effective um, by, uh, by utilizing this clinic. So I'm going to talk quickly about eosinophilic esophagitis, um, just kind of using this case as a learning point for um, one of the diagnoses that we do see in the upper air digestive clinic. So eosinophilic esophagitis is a non-IgE mediated inflammation of the esophageal mucosa. It affects approximately 57 people per 100,000. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind, and as Dr. Chandran was saying, um, these kids can often ha be predisposed to having eosinophilic esophagitis if they have things like chronic rhinitis, asthma, eczema, food and environmental allergies, and atopy. So if two-thirds of children with these pre-exposing conditions may have EE, it's something really to keep in mind. Um, symptoms can include dysphagia, food impaction, abdominal pain and vomiting, poor weight gain and growth, which RC did have, and no re response to reflux medication. And I think that he's a really good example of that, that he had been on reflux therapy for a long time and really was not getting better. Um, the EE is uh, eosinophilic esophagitis is diagnosed with by EGD with biopsies. Um, we we suggest that a patient needs a multiple level of biopsies, the lower, mid, and upper esophagus, and two out of three of these biopsies need to be positive with greater than 15 eosinophils per high-powered field in order to diagnose eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, skin prick testing to look for allergies can be helpful, but only if it is positive. 
if it is negative, you can't rule out eosinophilic esophagitis, but the skin perk testing can be helpful in order to kind of determine what might be the triggers for the reaction. So in RC, you were able to see the, the furrowing and the white plaques, but eosinophilic esophagitis can progress to cause um, strictures and fibrosis and the the really the goal of treatment is to prevent this from happening which can obviously cause much more long-term um, severe problems so some of the treatment options are something called a elimination diet so milk soy eggs wheat fish and shellfish peanuts and tree nuts are the six primary triggers for eosinophilic esophagitis so we can start with a, a food elimination diet um, one kind of caveat to this is it does require a repeat endoscopy after each reintroduction reintrodu of food to look for inflammation and symptoms of the um, eosinophilic esophagitis. So if you're doing this, it can really lead up to five or six repeat endoscopies for the patient. Um, treatment with a PPI can be effective. Um, this is effective in about 60% of kids, but when you add a treatment with a topical steroid such as budesonide or fluticasone, the effect, the, um, it becomes much more effective with a, a, a symptom control rate of about 87%. Um, an elemental diet is highly effective, but it is not very well tolerated and most patients don't comply with this um, kind of diet. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next patient, which is um, OW. So this patient was actually born in Alabama in November of 2018. He was born at 36 weeks via, via emergency C-section for placental insufficiency. So he was very small at birth. He, his weight was three pounds, two ounces. And when he was born, he was noted to have hypotonia, a dysmorphic facies, a posterior urethral valve, and micronathia. He was kept at the University of Alabama for about three months. He was in the ICU for feeding and respiratory issues. Um, his course there was complicated by a perforated bowel that required drainage in the right lower quadrant. Um, during his stay there, he underwent a laparoscopic gastrostomy tube for, for poor feeding and weight gain, as well as bilingual, um, bilingual bilateral inguinal hernia repair. And once he was stabilized um, and starting to grow and feeding through the gastrostomy tube, the family uh, moved to uh, Louisville, to Kentucky. Um, once the family had moved here, he first presented to us in Norton Children's Hospital in September of 2019 with respiratory distress. During that visit, he was noted to have a barrel chest on physical exam, and an x-ray showed a Morgagni diaphragmatic hernia, which was repaired laparoscopically in 2019. He relapsed and was again repaired with mesh in March of 2020. His course was al also complicated by the fact that he had cervical spine instability, atlantoaxial subluxation requiring a TLSO brace. So I just mentioned all of this because it kind of explains why he presented to the Aero Digestive Clinic and his primary concern was frequent vomiting and difficulty feeding. So he came to us in May of 2020. At this point, he was diagnosed with a global developmental delay. He was vomiting frequently, which was very complicated by the fact that he was in this brace. And during his... Um, Lifetime, he was admitted multiple times for wheezing and bronchiolitis, uh, secondary to the frequent vomiting and feeding problems. So again, as Dr. Chandran said with our last patient, um, you can already see that he's got feeding problems, he's got frequent vomiting, he's got respiratory issues. So he is a great candidate for the Air Digestive Clinic as he was seeing multiple spe uh, specialty specialists during his um, course of care. In June of 2020, we brought him to the operating uh, room. He underwent a direct laryngoscopy and bronchoscopy. So during his um, laryngoscopy, I noted that he had these very um, prominent bilateral pulsatile masses in his posterior oropharynx. 
Um, that brought up an idea of maybe velocardiofacial syndrome. Um, he underwent a flexible bron bronchoscopy by Dr. Bickle that showed mild compression of the right middle lobe. A BAO was performed. His culture was positive for strep pneumonia, which was treated um, after this with levofloxacin. And his EGD showed mild gastritis, but no um, H. pylori infection. Because of those uh, pulsatile masses and the concern for velocardiofacial um, syndrome, I did order a CT scan of his neck. Um, as Dr. Chandra mentioned, we are trying to reduce the amount of uh, radiation and time under anesthesia, so we were able to get an MRI of his spine at the same time to evaluate his cervical spine instability. But he was noted to have torticollis, anterior and posterior hyperplasia of C1 vertebral body, a vertical orientation of the left atlanta occipital joint, and focal spinal, uh, spinal canalysis at the craniovertebral junction. However, he was not noted to have any vascular abnormalities, um, what I was concerned about during the direct laryngoscopy. But he has a lot of midline um, malformations. So once all of this was done, he continued to have multiple episodes of emesis per day. He had a gastric, a delayed gastric emptium was suspected, but this was not improved with erythromycin. Um, he had a study which was done to look for gastric emptium, but he did not tolerate this. He had several episodes of vomiting during the study. He went to interventional radiology to have a GJ2 place, but this was unsuccessful, so he was again brought to the operating room with Dr. Temtem, and she attempted to do a GJ2 placement by endoscopy, but at that time he was noted to have denuding of the gastric lining because of the multiple attempts to place the GJ2 by interventional radiology. So we were not able to place it, but she did do a Botox injection of the pylorus in order to uh, facilitate gastric emptying, um, which was actually very successful. So he is an ongoing patient that we are seeing in the upper air digestive clinic. His care obviously is very complicated. The plan currently is in, June, in October to have a surgical jejunostomy to place with Dr. Downard and to consider a formal pyloroplasty as the Botox, Botox injections were very successful in treating his um, gastric, gastric emptying. So he is a patient that we are going to be seeing um, in the, into the future um, as his care has been very complicated. I think that he's... So um, again, I'm just going to highlight his case and talk a little bit about, about congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Um, as you probably know, this is the failure of the diaphragm to fuse in utero. The diaphragm is what separates the abdominal cavity from the chest, and if there is a herniation there, that allows some of the stomach and intestine to move into the chest cavity and crowd the heart and lungs. This usually occurs on the left side, and because of that crowding of the heart and lungs, it can lead to pulmonary hypoplasia. There are four types of congenital diaphragmatic hernia, which are based on the location. The Boschidelic hernia involves the back or side of the diaphragm and is by far the most common, compromising about 85% of diaphragmatic hernias. The Morgagni, which our patient has, usually the front part of the diaphragm. Um, because of the location, it is much less likely to cause severe symptoms at birth and sometimes is not identified until adulthood. Um, there's a diaphragmatic hernia where the central diaphragm is, a portion is missing, and then um, the most severe where the diaphragm is absent or thin. Um, these are much less common. 10 to 15 percent of congenital, di congenital diaphragmatic hernias are associated with some other syndrome. Um, 5 percent are associated with other major organ anomalies, um, which we do see with our patient OW and 56, 50 to 60% are isolated. Some complications of congenital, congenital diaphragmatic hernias include respiratory distress, distress and issues, pulmonary hypertension, feeding issues and oral aversion, which we saw with our patient, severe reflux, constipation, bowel obstruction, psychosis, pectus, and overall developmental delay. Okay. 
The next patient is GA. Um, he was born at full term via spontaneous vaginal delivery, um, but at an outside hospital, and then was transferred to Norton Children's Hospital NICU for poor feeding, bradycardias, desaturation. Um, he had had um, a few modified barium swallows where um, I think one or two, one he had aspirated, but then the following one um, he actually did well and was discharged home on a PO diet. Um, I saw him at 11 months of age um, when um, mom and sent by the pediatrician because mom had been telling the pediatrician, um, I think from the nine month visit on, that um, she just was concerned about his swallowing and the fact that he was um, able to swallow well, seemed eager to eat, but did not seem to be handling the, um, the bolus very well. It seemed like he was very wet and would cough afterwards. So um, that was also coupled with um, the pediatrician and mom noticing just some low tone um, and delayed developmental milestones. So the pediatrician had ordered a modified barium swallow that um, demonstrated he had a silent aspiration. And as I said, that's when that prompted the um, ENT referral. Um, he, uh, he was um, shown to only be aspirating um, thin and nectar consistencies. And so um, typically my uh, protocol when a child is aspirating is I want to look at the upper airway and make sure that there's not any anatomic issues. So. Um, what we typically do in the office is we'll do a laryngoscopy, a flexible laryngoscopy in the office um, and up to the level of the vocal folds and kind of peek into the subglottic area. That initially looked well, but um, I felt like because of his um, modified barium swallow and what at that time he was thought to be a relatively healthy child um, with no other issues, maybe some concern for delayed milestones, I thought I would take him to the operating room and look for um, a laryngeal cleft, um, which uh, which could be a cause of aspiration, very difficult to see on exam in the office. So um, at that time, I um, thought I had identified a laryngeal cleft and put half a cc of an injectable material called prolarin into the space between the arytenoid cartilages. And so a laryngeal cleft... Have, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I do have slides of that coming up. So okay. I'm wondering now. Uh, sure. We'll go to. We'll skip ahead to that slide now. So this is kind of a classification of the laryngeal cleft, um, and that basically is a groove related to failure and development of the wall between the esophagus and the airway. It starts out as this common um, cavity, and then the wall between the esophagus and the airway then develops. And so. Um, Typically, there's different classifications and there's even controversy of which uh, type of cleft would be under what type of classification. But this is the most common classification used in which type 1 is a groove that is identified above um, the vocal folds. And there is a normal groove between the arytenoids, which is the joints that move the vocal cords. Um, however, um, this groove would be deep um, uh, to the level of the cricoid cartilage, but not extending into the cricoid cartilage as you see in number two and then number three extends even deeper past the uh, through the whole cricoid cartilage into uh, the proximal part of the trachea and then type four goes um, way into the thoracic inlet um, so these are kind of some pictures um, that second row of pictures and third row of pictures is kind of what we would see so normal would be um, in the a column uh, type one is we actually this is why we would put the child to sleep if you can see you know this is um, when the child is in the office Typically, they're crying um, when we put the scope in their nose, and we can see vocal cord mobility, see if there's any mass obstruction or anything like that. But really seeing that space where the probe is in type B, um, it is, it is kind of, or in column B, it's, it's hard to see that in a crying, moving, small larynx. So when we put the child to sleep, we can actually palpate that space between the vocal cords and see if that groove seems to be a little bit deeper. So you can see between A and B that that groove in column B or the type 1 cleft is slightly deeper. It's extending to the level of the vocal folds. Again, like I said, that's controversial. It seems to be sometimes subjective. Um, uh, 
However, the treatment that, um, and this is kind of what um, GA looked like, the treatment or initial treatment, one of the treatments you can do is you can inject a filler, which is the same type of filler that plastic surgeons use to fill in um, wrinkles or um, grooves in an aging face. And so this filler is dissolvable, it's very biocompatible, and um, we uh, inject it through a long needle into that space to kind of build up the robust nature of that wall and give the, um, the bolus resistance to me and so it will preferentially go into the uh, esophagus and not fall into the airway. And then if you look into column C, D, and E, which is going to be types um, uh, 3 and um, 4, um, and uh, you can see that there's a um, just a widening and a kind of an extension of that groove further into the uh, trachea, which clearly would be more of an aspiration issue. Type 1 clefts are, as I have stated a couple times now, controversial. Because it is thought that a lot of children with type 1 clefts could eventually outgrow it um, and uh, that no intervention would necessarily be needed. So here's actually a, um, a picture of um, uh, injecting that uh, material into that space between uh, the arytenoids. And so uh, um, in picture A, you can see the needle kind of uh, being placed into that space. And then um, picture B, you can actually see some of that injectable going in. It looks a little fatter. Um, and uh, you can actually see some of the material coming out. Um, so we went ahead and did that. Um, uh, we went ahead and did that uh, procedure, and um, actually after that procedure, he um, he continued to aspirate, and this time across all consistencies. And um, you know whether that was something that might have been occurring at baseline or um, was affected by time or the injection. Um, you know, we'll never know. And you know, I had a discussion with the speech pathologist, and that's something that I think. Um, I think it's important to kind of understand what a modified barium swallow it is. It is a, it is a study that you're testing different consistencies to see whether a child is aspirating. And you know the way that I describe it to parents though is a, it's a moment in time. You know, if you do this procedure at three o'clock in the afternoon versus eight a.m. in the morning, it probably will show you a different result because you're not taking into factors of fatigue. You're not necessarily taking into factors other things that may be going on in the child's life, like a congestion or whatnot. So um, I think that. Um, using a modified barium swallow to look for gross aspiration is important, but I also think we need to take some of these other factors in mind. And so, and the reason I say this is um, because the um, speech pathologist had mentioned when she reviewed the original swallow study that prompted the ENT referral, she was um, concerned that maybe even though she let him pass for um, thickened feeds that there was a potential and there was some hesitancy um, in that swallow and that perhaps if he had done that swallow repeatedly he may have aspirated that as well and now we're kind of seeing that on the repeat swallow study. So regardless at that point because of that swallow finding um, we uh, admitted him to Norton Children's Hospital after I actually went down to radiology and reviewed the film at the time that he was there um, and um, discussed with general surgery and speech pathology and kind of given his low tone nature we decided that we would put a feeding tube in the child but um, uh, you know and then ramped him up and he was discharged home on a, um, on a G-tube um, regimen. Um, Subsequently, while he was an inpatient, we had neurology see him. We actually got a genetics consult just to help expedite things. And I think that, again, shows that, you know, um, this model of being able to coordinate care. And unfortunately, in this case, it took an inpatient visit to do that, um, which, you know, was kind of the previous model from 30 years ago that prompted all of these upper air digest, or I'm sorry, multidisciplinary clinics. But uh, we were able to get some more information on the child while he was an inpatient, and um, which kind of further, um, you know, uh, helped make the decision for a G tube. He did home, but one of the things that I really wanted to emphasize to the mom was 
he has a normal um, swallow except for aspiration. So he had the desire to swallow, he um, had the oral phase of swallow which was normal. Um, the pharyngeal phase was actually um, I think normal as well but it was just the fact that he was aspirating. So could this relate to a tone issue? Could this relate to something that could be rehabilitated? So I really encouraged um, the mom to um, pursue speech therapy and continue with swallowing under guidance of a speech therapist so he would not lose what he already had. Um, he um, never had any pneumonias, never had any bronchitis and um, he started to take PO intake with the help of a speech pathologist um, and um, started out with the free uh, the Fraser free water pro protocol which we'll talk about in the in, in the next few slides um, but with the with the aid of a speech pathologist um, he carefully began eating again and he actually ended up passing an, um, for a normal swallow um, on a couple occasions and with um, guidance seemed to have much clearer swallow and no indication of aspiration after a couple months of therapy aggressive therapy so here is a modified swallow um, that shows a normal swallow mechanism. So basically what we're seeing on this video, the black is the contrast that the baby is swallowing and you can see that the contrast is all passing in a bolus down through the um, oropharynx, hypopharynx, and into the esophagus. It kind of all stays together. There's no spillage. Um, this is normal swallow. And the second video here is um, an abnormal swallow study. So what we're seeing here is that same bolus contrast, but what you see is you see the spillage of the material up into the back of the tongue, the vallecula, and then going down. You can see flashes of the contrast going down into the airway. So that's anterior. So you'll see this little strip, not as, not as bad as the um, original bolus, but you just see this little strip that goes kind of parallel to the to the larger bolus going down, and that little strip is actually going into the airway. And that's what we see on swallow study. So that same um, swallow, you know, that same B is done with multiple consistencies because, as you probably know, a thin liquid is much more difficult to control than thicker consistencies or a solid. So um, when there's a neurological issue or tone issue that mostly that starts to affect the thin liquids more than the thick liquids or solids and those can be much more effective with um, if there's a physical obstruction. Um, I didn't talk about this but I, I just want to mention here that we also have the ability to do a, a fees which is a, a video study so basically um, Dr. Chandran and I, or, or I go down to speech pathology and we actually put the flexible laryngoscopy into the baby's nose and while we are physically looking, the speech pathologist will feed the baby different consistencies of liquids, purees, um, apple juice, pudding, applesauce. And we can actually watch in real time what's happening with the swallowing. And again, it's tricky because the babies usually are crying, um, but it really helps to kind of see in a 3D picture what is going on with the swallowing mechanism, where things are spilling, how the baby is clearing the, um, the liquids or the food out of the um, pharynx while they're swallowing. So that's something else that we can also do and coordinate. Uh, through the Aero Digestive Clinic. Uh, so there, I'm just going to talk. Use this case to talk about swallowing. Uh, there are four phases of swallowing: the preparatory phase, the oral phase, the pharyngeal phase, and the esophageal phase. Uh, mostly, we as otolaryngologists are kind of looking at that oral pharyngeal phase, uh, um, as well as the esophageal phase with their, our colleagues in gastroenterology. Swallowing actually starts to develop at 10 to 14 weeks of gestation. And by 34 weeks, most infants have a coordinated swallow. Swallowing is a combination of voluntary and involuntary motor responses. Um, for example, you have to inhibit respiration with the initiation of the 
pharyngeal phase, and that is done involuntary, involuntarily. Symptoms of issues with swallowing, um, as I think our patient GA demonstrated, is just having a chronic wheeze or strider, wet or congested airway sounds after or during feeding, coughing, choking, and gasping with feeding, and then just general irritability with feeding. Some more severe symptoms of swallowing dysfunction would be recurrent bronchiolitis and recurrent pneumonia. Dysphagia and swallowing issues can resolve by two years of age time in therapy, and I think that GA is a good example of um, what the importance of doing therapy is. Um, and also not having oral aversion, you know, continuing to do some PO feedings therapy, this free water, Fraser, the Fraser free water protocol, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, but once a baby loses that desire to suck and swallow and feed, it is very difficult at that time to get that back. So keeping some PO intake and therapy is super important as a lot of children will resolve on their own. I just highlight a study here by Davis in 2013 that looked at 101 aspirating infants and found that um, most had significant improvement in swallow function with, with feeding therapy um, when there's no underlying disease process predisposing to dysphagia. Um, again, just highlighting that there's good prognosis with feeding therapy, it's very important. Um, okay, so um, I just want to highlight too, and I think that this kind of got talked about with GA. So, in order to kind of facilitate oral feeding, and with the knowledge that most kids will get better on their own, we are trying to put in place a protocol in the Air Digestive Clinic of children who are aspirating. So. Our target, target population is children who are less than two years of age with an isolated developmental dysphagia who failed a swallow study to avoid an automatic G-tube. And I, I mean, this is even since I've been here, so only, you know, the last three years that I would get a call from the speech therapist or radiology that this baby was aspirating, they would get directly admitted to the hospital to um, start the workup for a G-tube placement. Um, it is known that G-tubes worsen reflux, they decrease motility, and actually slow improvement in swallow function. So we're trying to kind of reverse what we're doing here and, and use a little bit more uh, data to think about how we treat these patients. So another option and what we're trying to employ is placing a nasogastric tube and starting feeding therapy. Um, the goals of that therapy are to promote oral skills safely and to buy time for the swallow to improve, as we know in majority of cases it will. Uh, some feeding strat strategies can be to change positions during feeding, to, con to maintain a neutral midline position, and these are things that help reduce the risk of aspiration. <coughs> decrease the flow rate and thicken liquids, and then finally the spray water protocol. So this was developed here at the University of Louisville. <coughs> and in our babies that have um, difficult swallowing, it's noted that free water poses little risk to the patient in terms of recurrent pneumonias and bronchiolitis. It provides good oral hygiene and improves patient compliance and decreased risk of dehydration. So this is something that we can be doing to help maintain good oral function in these babies while we're waiting for the swallow to improve on its own. Okay, so this is a kind of the wrap up slide. So Currently, we are having this era digestive clinic about a half a day a month. We're seeing about six patients per clinic. We had a big break with the um, coronavirus pandemic. Um, we just started seeing patients again in June. Um, we are already looking to expand, we'll either go to another half day or a full day because we are booking out now all the way to December with new referrals. So you can just kind of see the need for this um, clinic. Our goal of the clinic is re to return a care plan to the family and healthcare team within two weeks of our evaluation. So far, we've had excellent patient satisfaction and education. 
And moving forward, as we're doing with this um, swelling protocol, we want to focus on quality outcomes for patients with complex health problems and to sort of change the dynamic of how we're treating these complex patients. All right. All right, and with that, we'll take any questions. I know there were some in the chat. Um, one first from Dr. Schickler regarding eosinophilic eosinophilic esophagitis with one of your first patients and that soft patch, soft tissue palate defect. Concern for Erler Danlos. Um, Dr. Schickler, no, I don't think that we did consider that. Um, and so that, I mean, we're happy to make that uh, referral. Um, we um, have not seen that clinic patient back in the clinic yet. We'll have to ask Dr. Temtem. I think we just thought that um, she would be following them along with the allergist. Um, and uh, the, the issue with the soft palate, I don't know that it necessarily has declared itself functionally. Um, you know, he hasn't really started talking yet, so I think there's just some delay in, in speech development. But as far as, uh, I think there, there might have been some concern because the, the hyperemesis was just so severe that it would, there would be nasal regurgitation. And sometimes that can happen with or without. So um, I think at this point, maybe since he's probably gotten a little um, bigger, we can do another evaluation, maybe ask him to come back to the ENT clinic to maybe do a better evaluation of the palate and then uh, consider a rheumatologic um, evaluation. Uh, if his uh, palate was really floppy, uh, Abonia up in Cincinnati has published about the coincidence of eosinophilus esophagitis with elder damage. So be something to consider if that's a floppy palate as opposed to a yeah. strip of normal one. Thank you. Um, how are we tracking patient feedback? Are there surveys that are going out? Not yet. Uh, not yet. I think it's just kind of word of mouth. And Bree, um, who is our coordinator extraordinaire, she is um, wearing many hats. And at this time, I think she's just calling every patient and family um, quite frequently and just getting um, feedback uh, informally. But uh, I think at the one year mark or when we've got a kind of critical number of patients to be able to um, submit a survey for meaningful results, we certainly are planning to do that. I think one complication right now is that the otolaryngology department is not yet merged under Norton. Um, we are still with ULP, so in December we will officially merge with Norton. Then the data and everything will be much easier to track through EPIC, and that's kind of our goal once we are all um, under the same system. Um, Okay. Oh, that's great. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Dr. Kim just mentioned that there's a, a, a new EOE clinic uh, with Dr. Buckley, a multidisciplinary clinic. So that's fantastic. All right. Any other questions? Thank you for having us today uh, to speak about this clinic. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone.